Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I cannot complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. You are Robert Kagan, well-known uh, foreign policy intellectual. Uh, you're at the Brookings Institution. You write opinion pieces for The Washington Post. You've written a number of books, including one that was published mere weeks ago called The Jungle Grows Back. Uh, America and Our Imperiled World, in which you indict Donald Trump, to some extent Barack Obama, and issue kind of an all-purpose, I guess, is Jeremiah the term? Is that a fair? Yeah, probably I shouldn't be endorsing it, but it's hard to get around the, the general negative tone of the book. It's a lament. Yeah. It is a lament about what has become of American foreign policy, uh, especially lately. So um, let's start by, why don't, why don't we like situate you ideologically uh, in the moment? Because for a long time, you were known as a neoconservative, right? In the 90s, in the aughts. Uh, in fact, you were, I would say, a pretty central figure in the movement as it applied to foreign policy. You've quit. I think you've quit calling yourself that, right? Well, I was never, I never called myself that because I, I mean, in a, in a very technical sense, it did not apply to me because the term neoconservative meant that you had once been on the left and then were now on the right. That was the original understanding. Um, I don't think anything about my foreign policy is conservative and I don't think anything about it is new. So in all respects, I have a problem with neoconservative. Now, uh, other people want to call me what they want to call me, and that's fine. I think if I had to, uh, as I try to find a label that fits, I would say liberal realist is probably the closest that liberal I can come realist. to. And the reason I say realist is because I do consider power to be a central element of what determines yeah. uh, which ideals or set of principles win, I actually would argue that I'm more realistic than some of the people who call themselves realists about what things, well, how bad things can get uh, when you don't establish a kind of order. And I certainly am not like John Mearsheimer, whose latest book really is an attack on liberalism. I am in favor of liberalism. Of course, we all like to think we're realistic. But I take your point yeah. that, I mean, an interesting thing about foreign policy realism is it has two sides. It has a descriptive side. It's a whole theory about how the world works. And then it has a prescriptive side. Now, I would say, descriptively, you do remind me of a realist. In fact, I was just thinking that yesterday, that, that your view of the world as a kind of a jungle where, you know, powerful countries are going to do the sometimes unfortunate things they do, and you got to deal with that one way or another. That's a very realist appraisal, but I would say policy-wise, you don't have much in common with, I mean, yeah, Mearsheimer or Steve Walt. I, ju I just had a conversation oh. with him. He's got a book coming out, right? I mean, you do, ideal, uh, prescriptively, you're not much like these realists. No, no, no. The people who have uh, sort of cornered the market on calling themselves realists are for are all about restraint uh, and retrenchment. And they are, as you say, in the prescriptive sense, I think those realists believe that what makes the world go round is a balance of power and the restraint that is required on a part of a nation to engage in a kind of balance of power. Um, I don't happen to believe that applies to the present set of circumstances, given the nature of power in the international system, and that they are trying to apply a model that might have worked for the concert of Europe in the early 19th century, but bears no relationship to what's going on now. And I will just further say that I think there's a very heavy dose of moralism in their realism, that they would like America to practice restraint, I think, in no small part for moral reasons, not for practical reasons, although they would certainly argue that there are practical reasons as well. I think they'd be happy to hear that almost because so many people accuse realists of being amoral. No, I think American realists are actually Puritans um, and they want good behavior for its own sake and in a certain sense run contrary to realist theory, which suggests that if you're powerful, you should, you would, nations exercise their power. 
they're actually asking the United States to exercise less power than it has. Now, it's all very complicated and we could have all these debates, but I do think that there is a moral, if you read Morgenthau, as I'm sure you have, there's a moral component to Morgenthau's prescription as well. Yeah. Um, he thinks that America's gonna get, he thought at the time that America was gonna get us all killed with its messianism. And so, uh, so I think in that sense, there's always been a moral core to that kind of realism. I also think realists pride themselves on putting themselves in the shoes of all the actors around the world. That isn't to say, you know, you feel their pain and get all empathetic in that sense. But in the sense of perspective taking and understanding the perspectives that drive behavior, I think they, they put a premium on that. And you could, you could argue that that uh, is sometimes conducive to moral behavior. Well, I think I do, too. I think I understand the actions and motives of other nations. Um, the question is sort of whether you have to, having understood the motives and actions of other, uh, other countries, whether that means you have to acquiesce to them. So, for instance, I know that Russia feels slighted in the international system. Um, I don't know what we could or ought to do to deal with that problem. And I think that's where realists and I or at least people who call themselves realists and I uh, would differ. By yeah. the way, I'm sure your audience, if they hadn't turned this thing off already, is now hey, definitely, have, you don't uh, worry about that kind of thing, Bob? No, uh, no I long ago quit seeking <laughs> <laughs> anything involving anyone paying attention to me. Okay, <laughs> well, I think um, we're accomplishing that objective. <laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking maybe this conversation could, could like get a reputation for being like, whoa, incredibly learned and highbrow. And then even people had no idea what we were talking about, which as you know, it would be everyone would flock to it just as a way of, you know, kind of um, virtue signaling or something. Is that the way this is working today in the modern media world? I didn't uh, realize, I, I, I missed that part. That way, actually, yeah. but, 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 okay, I take your point. I mean, no, uh, no, I'm happy to keep talking about it. <laughs> well, I mean, you're right that we haven't quite defined, well, we did kind of define what realism is descriptively. Let's go back to the question uh, of ideology, because I want to be clear. So you're not saying you've really changed appreciably it's just that neoconservatism the label never applied to you strictly speaking yeah i was never comfortable with the label uh just because i didn't think it actually did describe me and a lot of the people who got called neoconservatives i didn't agree with i mean jean kirkpatrick was supposed to be a neoconservative and i didn't agree with her about practically anything um and i certainly you know insofar as neoconservatives went off and became sort of I would say very hawkish anti-Islamists. That's not where I am either. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's just a lot of air. I don't like being in any group, Bob, honestly, and I don't like being called anything. Probably you don't either. Um, I don't know what people call you and what you want to be called. Nothing. Uh, As I said, no one pays attention to me. Don't. Yeah, don't right. Anyway, so I, you know, I think that what I write speaks for itself, and you can call it what you want to call it, right? Yeah, I mean, actually, what I would like to be called is a progressive realist. I've written about it a couple of times, but we can get it. If you're a liberal realist, in theory, we're just inches away, but we can talk about all that. Well, that's a, the, the distinction between progressive and liberal is an interesting one these days. Yeah. So um, so then uh, where to go? Maybe we should start with uh, with your indictment. So you are lamenting uh, the fact that there has been an erosion of what is sometimes called uh, the uh, sometimes called the liberal international order, sometimes called the rule rule based international order. Are those the same thing to you? First of all, no, and I don't. I think that it's 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 a misnomer to describe what I would call the liberal world order as strictly speaking rules based, because quite obviously, certainly the United States, but probably other great powers within the order, have not abided by the quote unquote rules all the time, and that's certainly the case. When it comes to strategic and military action, the United States is not abided by rules. I do think on the economic side, it has been more of a rules-based order. And the fact that the United States has abided by those rules has been a strengthening element in that order. But to describe the whole order as rules-based implies that you actually are waiting to, for the UN Security Council to vote on a military action before you take it, which certainly is not the case uh, in the terms of American behavior. It is the case in progressive realism, you'll be happy to hear, but uh, we'll get to that. Okay. And how it's less, a, less, uh, a less unfortunate constraint than you might imagine, in my view. 
So, um, so you do, I mean, you're, you're okay with liberal international order being the thing who's, pa- who's erosion you lament so long as we don't think it's deeply rule-based or you just have your own special terminology for what, for the, what's eroding. Well, I think what's eroding is it's a very concrete thing. It's not as theoretical, I think, as some people treat it. And so for me, it is, uh, the particular structures of power and, and to some extent institutions that were established after World War II. The two key pillars of the liberal world order are the fact that Germany and Japan were transformed from aggressive dictatorships to Pacific democratic economic powerhouses, which sort of laid the foundation for the spread of both democracy and prosperity and peace in two regions of the world that had been basically destructive, that it is the United States' role in uh, keeping those two regions peaceful by sort of providing security and therefore trust that is sort of the backbone uh, of the order, and that within that fundamentally safe zone for liberalism, there has in fact been enormous progress in the way governments deal with each other and in the way that they deal with their own citizens. Outside the order, which is to say, Russia, China, parts of the Middle East, uh, uh, and elsewhere, people have been abiding largely by different rules, although they're affected by the power of the liberal world order themselves. Okay. How does that sound? Uh, that sounds okay. So give us an example of, say, something Trump has done that threatens what you had liked about the post-World War II world. Well, I think he's done a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, I think the mere declaration that the United States is now officially out for itself, that it's looking after its own sovereign interests is a, is a statement of departure from what American policy has been, which is that yes, it's pursuing its own interests, but in a kind of enlightened far sighted way, uh, which includes looking out for the interests of others as well. So if Trump views every transaction as a zero-sum, I win, you lose game, especially on trade, that's not the way the United States has been dealing with trade agreements with with allies uh, for many years. So uh, it's the willingness to exploit the American power within the existing system exclusively for American purposes that is a big departure from the past. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's not just rhetoric. I mean, the rhetoric matters because, of course, every country in the world has to decide what the United States is up to, and they have to adjust themselves accordingly. And there are, of course, other things that Trump has done, like declaring that he doesn't want to fight for Montenegro and and things like that. But that basically he is breaking the compact. But if I were to articulate like a relatively smart version of what a Trump-esque complaint about the previous world order is and somebody's got he can't do it some it's a job somebody's got to do but i think a relatively sophisticated one would be um let's take japan so they uh agreed to kind of uh come within our security umbrella you might say we certainly provided the the bulk of the force and they became a reliable ally and kind of i mean one story is Kind of in exchange for that, we gave them expanded access to our car market, and they used it to good advantage to, um, you know, send a lot of cars into America. Um, And I think what Trump would say would be, wait a second. We are, on the one hand, we're paying for their defense, and you're saying that in exchange for that, we do something else for them? Shouldn't they do something for us? But instead, we opened our auto market to them. They used it to good advantage. It hurt American workers. I think that's a relatively sophisticated version of his critique that, again, he's, I think, unaware of. Well, I actually don't think you're giving him enough credit. I think he, he could even make that argument himself. So Maybe he has. Uh, Maybe I'm not giving not, him enough credit. It's not that sophisticated. And, well, but it's and, more, what I mean is, um, most of what he says about trade is, you know, less sophisticated than that. Well, in any case, it's, it's, it, it is the right way of putting the, the question, and, it, and it, it is something that I think, again, this transcends Donald Trump. I think that you didn't have to be Donald Trump to, to, to have that feeling. Americans have had that feeling. You could certainly see it in the Democratic Party as well. Um, and so I, I don't think this is limited to Trump. And the, and the answer to it is uh, that 
we have to remember that we basically told Japan after World War II, you are now out of the geopolitics business. You are now out of the expansive military power business. And uh, because you have been far too dangerous and this is no longer acceptable. Uh, by the way, they didn't, you could say they agreed to this, but they agreed to it after having been, had two nuclear bombs dropped on them and had, you know, uh, thousands of American forces in their country to this day. Now, in exchange for which, we encourage them, again, largely for our own reasons, to succeed economically uh, and to pursue and to sort of change over their economy from production of military equipment to production of non-military equipment, which, by the way, came to include cars instead of tanks. Um, and they took all the sort of Japanese genius that they applied to building weapons and turned it into building automobiles and other things. The growth of their economy created uh, economic opportunity for other nations in the region, which created overall economic opportunity, which benefited the United States and created stability in East Asia. And yes, at certain times in our trade competition, uh, they exploited advantages or took advantage of the fact that they were making better cars than Americans were, which I think was undeniable in that period. So Americans wanted to buy Japanese cars, etc. cetera. Um, I'm sure that there were losses involved for us, but I would say the gains in the arrangement that in the arrangement that I just described are so much greater than the losses. And that's where I really feel like the problem with the, not just the Trump argument, but the general public argument is you take for granted all the gains and you only look at the costs. So the costs are, we are helping, by the way, Japan has one of the largest militaries in the world, quietly. So it's not as if nobody's accusing them of not spending enough money on defense. Is that true? Uh, oh, yeah. They I mean, have, for, until fairly recently, weren't they technically outlawed by themselves from having one? I think the key word there would be technically. Um, and the fact is they have quite a substantial uh, Navy and a very well equipped army and um, all in the name under, you know, under the heading of a peace so, force. Oh, yes. Um, those but, those Coast actually, Guard battleships. Right. I know the kind. Yeah. Right. So we, you know, uh, they it's not as if they're not actually uh, capable of doing taking care of their defense. And by the way, if we stop defending them tomorrow, they would become a nuclear power in about 24 hours and probably have a hundred or several hundred nuclear weapons overnight. So and that's the other half of it. So we are, in fact, getting enormous benefits that no one pays any attention to. But also, what is the downside of not doing it anymore? The downside is Japan goes its own independent way, sort of becomes a nationalist military power, only this time with hundreds of nuclear weapons. And is that really a better world for us? And I think the answer ought to be clearly no. So are we paying a price in this deal? Yes, but is the price much less than the alternative price? I think the answer is clearly that it is much less than we would be paying otherwise. Okay, then <clears throat> let me give you a different kind of challenge that a version of it might come from Trump supporters, but a version of it comes from me, and you've probably heard it. And it applies, I would say, uh, not just to neoconservatives, but to liberal interventionists pretty much because the things I'm going to describe, I think they pretty much both favored. But the, the critique is, wait a second, you guys are the ones that cast the old system in disrepute through a series of ill-advised interventions and, and arguably helped get Trump elected. So there was the Iraq War. Uh, if not for the Iraq War, ISIS might well not exist. And if not for ISIS, Trump maybe doesn't get elected. But in any event, that's pretty widely recognized as not a great success. There's, there's the Libyan intervention, which uh, up till the point where they went for regime change, which I think exceeded the UN mandate that started the intervention, um, I wasn't a big opponent of, but the regime change part, in any event, that doesn't seem to have worked out very well. Um, arming the Syrian rebels uh, does, you know, seems to have just basically amped up a civil war, increased the number of deaths and refugees, refugees, which again, helped Brexit get passed and Trump get elected and so on, probably, um, uh, without altering the fundamental outcome uh, of Assad um, remaining in power. Now, I know you would have wanted to do more in Syria. I, I, we, can, we can talk about that later. But, but that aside, the basic argument that uh, a series of interventions in the name of the kind of argument that I think you're advancing in this book, 
uh, even if in retrospect you might say some are bad ideas, um, have helped create uh, the again both uh, a, a tendency to view uh, what American foreign policy had been uh, dimly, and arguably the, 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 this series of things may have gotten Trump elected. Well, I mean, I would say a lot of things probably got Trump elected, but and you can't, you know, you can't, unfortunately, you can't play back history in a different way. You can, we can speculate about what would have happened if different things had happened. There's no question uh, that the, that the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan, which by the way, nobody really questions why we got into Afghanistan, but it has had much the same effect that you're talking about, right? Um, which is to make Americans disillusioned about the possibility of successfully using power in the world. I, I totally recognize that, and that's an unfortunate outcome. And I do think it argues uh, for someone like me to say we need to be m more selective than I might like to be because the downside risk is not just that you may not succeed in an intervention, which, by the way, I can think of many interventions where the United States didn't succeed, uh, but it didn't end our foreign policy. You know, I mean, even Vietnam which was far more costly than Iraq in, uh, in every respect, and certainly in terms of lives lost. And, well, don't shake your head. I mean, there well, we lost uh, the counter -argument, I mean, over 50,000 dead in, in, in four years. I mean, we lost more in a month uh, in Vietnam than we would lose in a year in Iraq. But in well, any sure. case, but, that, well, that's not argue can... the point. I, I think it, it suffice to say that the United States actually recovered uh, its its willingness to play, and the American public recovered their willingness to play a major role in the world and elected Ronald Reagan, you know, not very long after Vietnam. So the question is, why has Iraq, which is actually a lesser, although, you know, if it was a disaster, it's still a lesser disaster, why did that have such a major effect on on the public opinion? And I think that gets to the to the larger issue, which is what I argue in the book, which is that, Really, ever since the end of the Cold War, Americans have been asking, why are we doing this? I mean, not just why are we doing Iraq, but why do we have a huge defense budget? Why do we have to support all these allies? Why do we get involved anywhere? And Iraq, you know, tipped, the, tipped that over to some large extent, as, of course, did the financial crisis, which is, you know, not which is related to a different set of errors, which I don't personally feel taking, like taking responsibility for. But um, all these things uh, came into play. Now, you know... The question is not, and on Syria, I must say, you, you can't <laughs> blame uh, the, those who wanted to do more in Syria for the fact that we did less and it didn't work. I really do think that Syria is actually the flip side case. And I, you know, I've talked to a lot of audiences about the arguments that I make in this book over the past few weeks. And one area where I find sort of, uh, I would say, almost surprising agreement, you may not agree, but many people do agree, that if we did too much in Iraq, our response was to do too little in Syria. And that, in fact, we looked at Syria as if it was going to be another Iraq and, as a consequence, didn't do enough. And, yes, you're right. And, therefore, let, did, took, act, took sort of committed acts of omission that led to this enormous refugee flow, which did uh, destabilize Europe. And I think I have talked to a lot of, of former Obama officials who, looking back on it, wished that, that they'd done more in Syria. And so... You know, I think what that really means is we have to find the right balance. Now, I don't like people who say we need to find the right balance because that's kind of a cop-out because it doesn't tell you what to do in every situation. But the reality is it's hard to know what to do in every situation. You can't have a doctrine that says we're never intervening. I don't think you would support that, right? And then on the other hand, obviously, you're not going to say we have to intervene in every conceivable instance. So you're always in this situation of making choices. And the question is, how do you make that in choice as intelligently as possible? Yeah, I actually do have a, a clear criterion for intervention. Before I get to that, I, I want to say something about Syria. And before I get to that, I want to explain why I was shaking my head when you, you mentioned Vietnam. It's not, I mean, they, they were both bad in their own ways. But what Vietnam did not do is imperil the homeland. It did not create a bunch of terrorists. It, it did not create uh, terrorists abroad who were trying to fly over here and do stuff. Bob, I'm sorry. When did 9-11 happen? Was that before or after Iraq? Well, don't you think in principle it was possible that the terrorist threat could get either better or worse after 9-11? Are you saying that the Iraq and Afghanistan interventions actually helped dampen the terrorist threat in retrospect? I mean, ISIS actually, I'm not the only one who says Iraq. I'm not the only one who would say that. I mean, the, as, a, as a matter of fact, what happened in Iraq, and I'm not, I'm, by the way, this is not me saying what a wonderful success Iraq was, but it certainly is the case 
that Iraq attracted pretty much every terrorist in the world to Iraq, where many of them were killed. And it is a simple fact that I don't think you can dispute that since 9-11, there's not been another 9-11, even though when they took polls of every conceivable counterterrorism expert in those years, they said it was only a matter of a few years before we got hit again. So I'm not claiming that Iraq solved the problem, but you can't make the opposite claim. Sure I can. That it made it worse. I absolutely can. I mean, first of all, you may say that actual, a lot of actual behavior notwithstanding, I mean, you know, what are we what are we talking about? We haven't been hit again in that way. True. And and you know, it's not clear to me that I, we are I don't know how danger. you know we I don't know how you know we would have been hit uh, had we not invaded Iraq. I mean, obviously well, security the, has tightened you're up the immensely. factual expert around here. You're always picking up diff- what would have happened if other things had, had not happened. But all well, I'll tell you what wouldn't have happened. You know what wouldn't have happened? The what? guy who created the precursor for, for ISIS in Iraq would not have done that because he did it in Iraq. And, and another thing, let me finish. Another thing that would not have happened is that a number of uh, people in America committing homegrown terrorism and explicitly saying we're doing this because of the Iraq war, because of the Afghanistan war, because this proves you're at war with, with Islam, which of course is a confused, uh, confused, I think, on their part. But repeatedly, people who have committed homegrown terrorism have said, we, we, we did it because of the Iraq war, the Afghanistan. Now, you may think that, that they don't know why they do things, but I'd love to hear your argument for why. And I would say, again, had there been no homegrown terrorism, you know, no Boston Marathon bombing and so on, I don't think Donald Trump would be president. But in any event, the main point I'm making is this is different from Vietnam. And one problem I had both with neoconservatives and a lot of liberal interventionists is I don't think they understand the ways the world have changed, the way it's easier for a variety of reasons, ranging from information technology to munitions technology, for a relatively small group of people who hate you and may be scattered around the world to actually do harm to you in the homeland. That's something that wasn't the case during Vietnam. It is now. I don't see how you can argue that, that, that the, there, none of the homegrown terrorism uh, was due to the, these various wars. And, and I don't see how you can argue with any kind of confidence oh, that, oh, well, ISIS would have somehow magically appeared even if we hadn't provided the incubator. Bob, I don't know why you're straining so hard to try to demonstrate that Iraq was somehow worse than Vietnam. I just think that's an ahistorical position and you should, and you're really working very hard to make that point. However, I will respond, I will respond to what you're saying, okay? If you wanted to ask what is the real origin of terrorist attacks on the United States from radical Islamic forces, the real origin was the first Gulf War, not the second Gulf War. The first Gulf War, which created, in essence, bin Laden, which created the hatred for the Saudi regime for being too friendly to the Americans who were in the region. Um, the entire Al-Qaeda movement, which was coming from Egypt and Saudi Arabia, was more than anything a response to American behavior in the first uh, Gulf War, which you have nothing to say about. I do have something um, to say about that. Actually. Well, OK, but then, you know, and then the other element of the, uh, the, the, the terror attacks on the United States stems from when we supported the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. That's right. Back beginning in the late 1970s and, and throughout the 80s which then led to what some people have term, uh, termed blowback and the fact that we uh, supported the Mujahideen. So you'd have to, you want to unwind that too. You don't want to have supported. Well, I think in retrospect, it was a bad idea. It doesn't mean right. I foresaw so, so, that. So what you're, what you're dealing with here, and I want to make another point in a second, um, but what you're dealing with here is that um, every action that you take, including winning the Second World War, has bad consequences. The, 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 we won the Second World War, and the Soviet Union wound up in control of half of, of Europe, and that's why Pat Buchanan thinks we shouldn't have gotten into World War II because of that outcome. So a lot of the, the positive outcome after the Persian Gulf War, the first Gulf War, which you know drove Saddam out of Kuwait, also produced terrorism against the United States as did our efforts against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the 70s and 80s. So you can add a rack, second rack to that list, but it would, be, it would be absurd to claim that it's because of the second Iraq war and that alone that we have been attacked by 
Islamic radical terrorists. I never now, let said me just that. make another I never point. said that. I never said. I mean, you did. You are saying that. And so the I, second I said, thing I, is, wait, we, you're going to rewind the tape and find me saying it's the Iraq war and the Iraq war alone that accounts for all homegrown terrorism. Good well, luck. You didn't you didn't make the other points and you should if you're going to make that point. OK, Rob, I mean, you really oh, should so, acknowledge so, that it's a whole series of actions by the United States over tw over 30 or 40 years. So you're telling me what I should have said and then informing me that I'm wrong because that's wrong. But I didn't say it. OK, OK. Just to be clear, I don't ever want to say you're wrong, Bob. I just want to say that we need to look at the whole picture. But the second thing is, why, like the right wing, uh, do you want to say that the only terrorist attacks that occur in the United States are committed by Islamic radicals? We've had more terrorist attacks of one kind or another. We don't always call them terrorist attacks by people who have nothing to do with Islam and have nothing to do with, um, you know, what happened in Iraq or didn't happen. Right. You know, but those aren't the ones that got Trump elected. Those aren't the ones that got Trump elected. You know what got, I'm, I'm really, first of all, what got Trump elected, in my view, has nothing to do with terrorism. OK, separate from that, they freak people out. Look, I, I, I agree. It shouldn't be the case that Islamic Islam or radical Islamist terrorism, whatever you call it, freaks Americans out in a way that some, you know, some like nut in Vegas doesn't freak them out. I just think that's confused. But it's a fact that it does and that. Uh, politicians neither of us likes exploit that fact. That's just a fact. Well, th but you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't become one of those politicians. I'm not. I'm trying no, to. No, you are, them. because you want to use, the one you who use the it in the same way that they want to use it. You want to use it in the same way that they want to use it to score what the, whatever particular point you want to score at this moment, okay? I, I, I actually don't understand what you mean by that. Okay, I know you don't. It doesn't matter. I, the point is, Here's the larger question. Let's say that you're unhappy about what happened in Iraq. Nobody should be happy about what happened in Iraq. Do you think it makes sense, therefore, to say that our entire foreign policy needs to completely change, that the support that we've had for allies, that the support that we've given to an international free trade regime, to the fact that we are the basic uh, you know, uh, supporter of global security, that because of Iraq we should not be doing those things? Is that a logical? Is that a logical? I certainly next step? think our foreign policy should change a lot because I don't think Iran is by any means the only consequence. I mean, Iraq, I. Iraq is the only consequential blunder that we've made. I wouldn't say quickly. Uh, you said that if you want to go back further, well, the Persian Gulf War and the intervention in Afghanistan um, is what created uh, Bin Laden. I agree, but a you probably favored both of those. But but actually, also, I don't quite agree. I think the part of the Persian Gulf War that created uh, bin Laden was the part where we chose to keep our troops in Saudi Arabia after the war. That that's what drove him nuts, and I would have opposed that. Would uh, have? I mean, where were you? Were you not around at that time? Well, I mean, honestly, I don't think I was aware of it. I, I mean, I probably. Uh, <laughs> I, I I mean, we're talking what nineteen eighty uh, what? I mean, oh, I don't know. You must have been like I don't know, ten years old at that time. No, I, I just I, I just mean I don't I just mean I did not say anything about that. I'm not on record. No. I am on record opposing the Iraq war. Um, Congratulations. And a, lot of, a lot of things. And I'm in, I'm on, I'm on record favoring some interventions. But my point is that which interventions are you in favor of? Well, at the time, I supported the Bosnian intervention. And I would note, I would note that I was early on that. I was writing about that in the New Republic before it was cool. Well, before it happened. And one thing I note about that is it was legal under international law. It had the support of the Security Council. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't, the Persian Gulf War. And I Kosovo? Were you pro or against? No, I'm anti-Kosovo. That did violate international law. So for you, it's just a UN Security Council vote. If they say yes, it's a good war. And if they say no, it's a bad war. I can imagine circumstances under which they would say no. And even I would say, let's do it anyway. But I would point out, that if you go back and look at our interventions and say, suppose we hadn't intervened when they didn't say it was okay. Suppose we hadn't invaded Iraq. Suppose we hadn't in, uh, gone for regime change in Libya, but we had intervened when they did say it was okay. Persian Gulf War, Bosnia, and so on. I, I think uh, almost anyone would have to say, you know, we'd be better off. We'd be better off. Afghanistan is the one thing that's kind of gone south. It hasn't been a huge success. Uh, and, and that uh, was legal. But um, even there, if we hadn't invaded Iraq and taken our, our eye off the ball, who knows, that might have gone better. Uh, and and I, didn't, I didn't oppose that. I didn't champion it. I was like being ambivalent and, 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 and saying cautionary things without 
full throatedly saying it. Well, look, I, I don't really think this is a. I mean, honestly, including even though I said it, I don't think it should be about where were you and what was your view on X, Y, and Z. I, I still think we need to be asking the question: What should we be doing now? And we can revisit. And, and you can certainly be right in saying that the intervention in Iraq undermined support for the broader role that I think the United States needs to play. And it wasn't the only thing that undermined that support. I think the financial crisis had something to do with it as well. And I think the end of the Cold War had something to do with it, since most Americans thought our role was mostly about de dealing with the Soviet Union. But all that having been said, you can say this is the effect it had on public opinion, but we are still in the here and now, and we have to decide what policy we should have. So the question is, what policy should we have? And should it be uh, a policy that is roughly consistent with the commitments the United States made and the responsibilities it took on after World War II, or should it be different? There is an argument about that going on right now. And the people you've mentioned before, Mearsheimer and Walt, are talking about uh, changing the, the nature of the American role in the world. And so that's the question that we really need to be addressing. Yeah. And I'm talking about changing it in a different way than they are. But before we talk about the present, let's talk about the very recent past, because I said we'd get back to Syria. What I'm curious about is I know you, you um, I mean, my line about Syria is, look, we'd be better off, have been better off doing nothing than, than what we did. We just got more people killed, more refugees. He's, Assad's still in power. Uh, and there's various complications ensuing. But I didn't do very much, Bob. I don't know what you're talking about us doing. We armed, uh, you know, maybe a few hundred or maybe a few thousand fighters who didn't didn't accomplish very much. Well, I don't know what I, you're talking about. I actually about. meant we and our kind of implicit allies. In other words, we countenanced the arming by our various kind of friends in the region, and we did some arming ourselves. I mean, it collect. I mean, if you just it was, do in, the it was here, ineffectual. I mean, what? it was ineffectual, and I don't. I don't no, know. It why got tons of people killed. Are you crazy? What, we got tons of people killed. I all mean, those Assad was together. All those Assad arms together. was killing. Anyone who was an opponent, okay? I know. And by but, the way, but, he didn't limit himself to killing people who were armed. He also killed people who were just sleeping in their apartment building. I understand that, and it would have been a brutal, horrible suppression, but it would have happened a lot quicker and a lot fewer people would have died. I'm just I'm so saying glad to hear that, and I'm so glad to hear that you're so confident about that because we've never heard of a long, brutal extermination of a population. We've never heard of such a thing before historically. I don't know where you come uh, by uh, knowing exactly how long it would have been and how many people would have died. We can't be sure, but it just stands to reason that if you do the two thought experiments, he has shown that he's capable of, uh, of ultimately suppressing a pretty well-armed, in the scheme of things, insurrection. They were not well-armed. That's ridiculous. A lot. Of, oh, come on, Bob. Well if you look at all the arms from Turkey, from the, from the Gulf states, from us, that's a lot of arms, some of which were diverted from Libya, by the way. They were not well-armed. There was, there was not anything like a fair fight. They had no air power. They had no tanks. No, it they, wasn't a fair fight. I'm not saying it was. I'm just saying few pe fewer people would have died. There'd be fewer refugees. I, I don't really think that's... Hey, you know what? If, fewer people would have died in Europe if nobody had fought the Hitler. There would have been many fewer people dying in okay. Europe. Okay, there we used enough force. Now that leads no, to no, my not, next question. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about from 1939 to 1942. If no one had fought Hitler, there would have been many fewer people dying. Right, but there we know that we were capable of prevailing in a way that ultimately proved constructive. Oh, I'm glad we knew that. That is absolutely ahistorical. We did not know that, and we were losing for the first two years. No, of the I, said, so. I, said, I said there we know now. Oh, we, we now know, know. yes. Well, Which okay. leads to my question for you about Syria. So yeah. you think we should have uh, done more, and I'm kind of curious about what the scenario of success is. If it's like, I don't think you're saying let's occupy them again the way we did Iraq. That didn't work out well. But if we don't occupy them, given the way the thing was playing out, and so let's say we provide air power, I still, I would imagine you've got competing groups of rebels and warlords and stuff in the end. Maybe I'm wrong, but what I don't understand is how you can be, have anything approaching confidence, given our various previous experiments with regime change, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, how can you have anything like confidence that it would have worked out well to really go for regime change there, if that's what you're proposing. And if you're not, what are you proposing? Well, first of all, I, I wasn't proposing regime change. I was proposing providing a no-fly zone so that people, so that civilians wouldn't get killed by, you know, the, by, the, by the Syrian Air Force. And I think that that would have been something we could have done. I think we could even have prevented tanks from moving into particular cities. 
Uh, and so the idea would have been to protect people who were ultimately were either killed or driven into exile and refugee status uh, while negotiations continued uh, to try to come up with some kind of settlement. I mean, John Kerry went out there trying to find a settlement time and time again. If, if you talk to him in private, he said, I, this is impossible to do unless we put some military force on the table because the other guys have a monopoly on the military and we're asking them to stand down when there's no pressure on them to do so. So I think that if we had uh, been willing to, you know, use the military force for almost entirely humanitarian purposes, it still would have had the effect of forcing the other parties to at least consider the possibility of some kind of negotiated settlement. That's what that's what everybody who was involved with Syria wanted to do. That is what the Obama officials regret not having done. Uh, I think maybe even Obama himself regrets it. If you want to be the person who says we never should have done anything no matter what, you can be that person. But I don't think that is the consensus view, even among uh, former administration officials. Um. So do you imagine eventually uh, Assad abdicating or some kind of partition being negotiated or what? I think it's, I mean, look, it's not as if we've never seen a leader uh, continue in power and then hold some kind of election or some kind of referendum and then leave power. I, I could name half a dozen cases where that happened in South Korea with the military junta, with the case of Marcos and the case of Pinochet in Chile. Uh, you know, we act like this, these things have never happened before and they're absolutely impossible. And, you know, when you talk about Libya, I think that anyone who favored the Bosnia operation in the 90s should have seen what the formula in Libya should have been. Uh, that once you have uh, sort of addressed the problem of preventing the humanitarian catastrophe that, that Gaddafi was about to unleash uh, on the Libyan people, then you have to send in some kind of international peacekeeping force to separate the parties to make sure that the thing doesn't dissolve into civil war. That's what we did in the Balkans uh, on numerous, on several occasions. It was a perfectly good formula from the 1990s that we abandoned because we didn't want to make that kind of commitment because of our experience in Iraq. So, you know, if you want to blame every intervention uh, you want to say every intervention is a disaster because we refuse to do the obvious things that need to be done to make it a success. Well, then I suppose them, you know, I, I guess I could understand that. But it seems to me you of all people should know what we should have done in Libya, which would not have made it a disaster. No, I don't. Now, know. Well, by the way, I don't guarantee. I, I, I do know. I do know we started out doing what you recommend us starting out doing in Syria. And before you know it, we're going for regime change and it's a disaster. But uh, I, I don't I don't I don't know what the magical cure would have been in, in, in Libya. But uh, well, I, I'm not saying we didn't you wound up going for a regime change just because Gaddafi was pressing ahead and trying to kill everybody. And so, you know, that that was where that ended up. If he had been a more reasonable, I mean, you can't control the fact that a leader, you know, is essentially willing to commit suicide in order to kill as many people as possible. You don't know that Assad would have made that calculation. Uh, you don't know what calculation he would have made if you could have prevented the Russians from moving in and providing the kind of support that he did. And by the way, let me be clear. I'm not saying I know what a wonderful outcome we would have gotten in Syria. It wouldn't have been a wonderful outcome. There are no wonderful outcomes in these situations. Even Bosnia was not an unmixed outcome, right? So the question is, was it have been better or worse off than we are now? And I must say, it seems to me there were things we could have done that would have given us a better, not perfect, not even close to ideal outcome, but a better outcome than the one that we've got. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let me talk about an area where you do, I think, differ from, well, we're already talking about them, from the other realists. You're calling yourself a liberal realist. Um, uh, and that is... Russia. I mean, I don't know if you remember. Do you remember when you had a conversation? You probably don't remember with Frank Fukuyama on this platform on Blogging Heads TV, mm -hmm. and he was, I, as, if I recall correctly, forgive me if I don't, but he was skeptical of the Kosovo intervention. You were not, and he said, "I'm telling you, Russia's not going to like this, and they may that may put them into mood into mood to kind of mess with us around the periphery." And I think he even mentioned Georgia. And that breakaway part of Georgia, whatever it is, um, and uh, and that indeed transpired. We don't know for sure that Kosovo caused it, but I would say I think Kosovo had a lot to do with it. 
Okay, so, so, gonna, so there you go that. again. I mean, it was the Kosovo intervention was in violation of international law. And that's why the Russians did that. What's that? And that's why the Russians went into Georgia, because it was a violation of international law. Um, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's okay. why I wouldn't have done it. Well, but, I understand but, that, but don't, 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 you know, don't conflate two things. If you want to make the point, which is a legitimate point, that Russia's response to Kosovo was in part what they did in Georgia, I think that the, the evidence bears that out. Now, the question then becomes, and therefore what? So one option would have been, let, uh, you know, Milosevic kill as many uh, Kosovar Albanians as he wants to because you don't want to annoy the Russians, which may lead the Russians to do something you don't want them to do. That is one option. Um, and I think that if we go down that road and make sure that we're never doing anything, including in a part of the world that Russia has nothing to do with, it wasn't Russia to decide how many people should die in Kosovo, but if they feel that it's something that they should be having a say in, therefore we shouldn't do it lest they do some other bad thing. I think that is a very, that, that's a very foolish way to go about dealing with Russia. Russia has all kinds of uh, um, sort of bitterness and, in, and unhappiness about the way the Cold War ended. And I think that Russia, given the choice between sort of entering the liberal world order on the same terms that France, Germany, and Britain did, which is essentially giving up their geopolitical aspirations in return for integration and economic success, the Russian people and their leaders were unwilling to make that deal. So then we were back into a geopolitical competition, which means that they looked at every one of these actions in a kind of zero-sum fashion. So if we are in undertaking a humanitarian action in Kosovo, uh, they see that as somehow affecting their Slav brothers, and therefore they have a right well, to be upset about I, I it. Mean, do you really I mean, want to play? Do you really want to have a foreign policy built around Russian insecurities uh, in that way? I think it's a mistake, and it doesn't help. I, I I don't think they put it quite that way. And I want to describe the way they may. You said, well, their, their objection wasn't that it was a violation of international law. And no, probably not. But it's the two are not unrelated. And what I mean by that is um, from their point of view, I mean, look, they could point to all kinds of cases where the United States has done, has gotten people killed or subverted democracy by supporting uh, coups or supported death squads, done all kinds of things that uh, morally uh, are, some of which are morally objectionable in the sense that whatever they were supporting in Kosovo was, we've done it some cases far away from our shores, and we've said it's in our security interests to do that. Now, if the Russians say, you know, you guys screw around, and kill a bunch of innocent people, and violate international law, and subvert democracies, and on and on, and it's cool, because you say it's in your security interests, or, or to preserve some alliance, and if we say we're, we're backing an ally, or tending to our security interests, you say you have a right to intervene. I think that's more like their argument, and what it has in common with international law is, the principle of actual international law, if you respect it, is, you, you know, you can't be a hypocrite. You have to, you, you, it would be better for the world if there were rules that everyone abided by. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So I think the two are not unrelated. And I think the Russian critique, what, the, the, what I just said, I think they would say, is not totally without merit. I mean, you, you acknowledge, I think, uh, the imperfection of our history. And, 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 and I applaud you for not being one of these people who's, um, going around demanding to restore the, li the liberal international like rules-based order without acknowledging that we have broken a lot of the rules. At the same time, I think the Russian perspective on the issue of rules breaking is not one that I find it easy to casually dismiss. Either we should abide by them or let other people break them. I say abide by them. That's my view. And then we would be in a stronger position to punish Russia if it breaks them. But that's my view. Right. So here's what I would say in response. First of all, you don't want to make the case that if, if only we hadn't broken international law or acted in disregard of a security council, then the Russians wouldn't know what that was like. I mean, if you look at all of Russian history going back uh, centuries and certainly in the last century, the Russians don't need examples from us on how to kill people, how to intervene in other countries. Uh, how to kill their own people, etc. So 
we didn't teach the Russians how to do this by doing it ourselves. That's the first point. Now, the second point is, right, um, the second question would be, if you felt that you could get a UN Security Council resolution to take necessary actions uh, whenever they appropriately ought to be done, I think that would be uh, an argument, at least in your favor. The problem is, is that, as you know, the UN Security Council is made up of great powers with now markedly different interests. That's not the way Franklin Roosevelt envisioned it. He thought we would all agree in part and sort of share in the burden of maintaining peace in the world. And that was almost immediately not the case. And pretty much after the Korean War, which the Soviets abstained on because they weren't around, uh, there was never going to be a case during the Cold War when the United States and Soviet Union were going to agree on an intervention because there were too much geopolitics involved. And I think that's where we are now. There was a brief moment where the, the, the Russians and Soviets acquiesced in the first Gulf War. I think that was much more an outlier than, than the likely reality. And I don't think that, Kosovo, that what was happening in Kosovo was any less deserving of intervention than what was happening in Bosnia a few years earlier. The only difference being that the Russians sort of didn't oh, there was there was no slaughter on the scale of the of the Bosnian atrocities, right? Uh, would that partly be because we were doing something to prevent it from happening? Anyway, so uh, all of so that's all of that. But I will even go. I'll go even further and say, in essence, you are right that um, any power that says, "Look at what you're doing," so how can you tell us what we should be doing? is going to be right. And by the way, you shouldn't limit that to Russia. It was true of Germany in 1938 as well. You know, the Germans had an argument that the Sudeten Germans were being mistreated and having been artificially separated from Germany uh, by the Versailles settlement, and they were being mistreated within Czechoslovakia, which was basically hostile to them, right? The Germans had a case, Hitler had a case. And the other side is always going to have a case. The Chinese have a case that this order was not created for them and Japan should not be, it should be, Japan should be sort of more subservient to China, et cetera, et cetera. The other side always has a case. But then you have to say, and then what? The fact that the other side has a case, the fact that, and this is, I don't know where you and I would agree on this or not. The fact is, in my view, there is no such thing as justice in the international system. Uh, there is only the power that is wielded, and one side or the other is going to basically uh, have the biggest influence. The, the world that you're envisioning, Bob, which is a world where everyone is abiding by international law and international institutions, is a wonderful world that has never existed, in my view, will yeah, never exist. There's a reason it's never existed. And that's what makes me a realist, by the way. <laughs> uh, it does make you a realist. And, and it, what it, another thing it gives you in common with the, with the Walt Mearsheimer realists is that I think uh, your, your descriptive, the descriptive part of your analysis, the diagnosis, does not take much account of the possibility that technology is changing the world in fundamental ways. That's right. That, that may make Definitely new things <laughs> possible, new things possible, both on the negative side, like I said, the forms of terrorism and so on, and, and, and hey, bioweapons haven't even hit yet, uh, and on the, potentially on the positive side. Which um, would be what? And, what? What is the technological breakthrough on the positive side? Well, we're at least capable of communicating in real Has time. That helped? Crisis, but, but the fundamental thing that... <laughs> Has communication that, helped? Uh, well, there are some new things about the world. Let me say the fundamental thing that technology has done, I think, is put nations more and more, even nations at great distances, in non-zero-sum relationships, which means, that doesn't mean it's, it's going to be a good outcome. They can play the games badly and have lose-lose outcomes. They can play them like nuclear weapons uh, permits massively lose-lose outcome. That's new. And, and that's a, a new reason to cooperate, for example. I, I could go on, but, but I wanna, what I want to do is get back to what you said, that, that the um, Persian Gulf War, yes, the UN Security Council authorized it, but that was a one-off. I'm not so sure. Uh, we don't know what would have happened. The, U, the U.S. at that point was in a really prominent and even dominant position. And, I, and we'll never know what would have happened if the U.S. had said, this is a new age, we're going to take international law seriously. This is the first example. We're going to try to establish the norm 
of actually abiding by international law. We'll never know what had happened, what would have happened. I'm more optimistic than you, partly because I think the world is changing and new things are possible. But in any event, I, I think the logic behind doing that would have been the following. We know that if uh, the world proceeds on its current path with countries like China getting richer and other countries developing, our relative power is going to decline. Our relative economic power is going to decline. Now, if you ask me what's the smart thing for a declining power to do, um, I would say try to create a world uh, where that where your 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 well-being, your your national security does not depend on your continued dominance, but on an evolving norm of actually obeying a common set of rules, especially given that whole new kinds of rules are going to be necessary to preserve the world's security, ranging from global warming to controlling biological weapons to controlling weapons in space, cyber weapons, and so on. That's the the argument. And, and the premise of both you and the other realists is the world never changes. I mean, I, I would say it, it's amazing to me that even amid what was all the tension between Russia and the U.S. and sanctions and everything, they like went along with the Iran deal. They, they participated in the sanctions regime. The ability to compartmentalize these kinds of things, I'm not sure what kind of historical precedent that, that has, but, I, I, and that's, that's really an asterisk. I would just say, I'm not convinced that the world of the past has to be the world of the future, and I'm not, I, and I am convinced we can't afford for it to be. Well, look, I mean, that's a very moving uh, speech, and I think that, you know... Are you a little misty-eyed there? Did I know that... I was getting a little choked up, it's true. And so I would say that in the 1990s, it was a more compelling argument than it is today, and I think that the trends are actually working against what you're talking about, that what we've seen since the 1990s is greater international competition, more geopolitics. We've seen uh, politically movements away from democracy, the convergence that I think a lot of your theory and John Eikenberry's approach is based on um, has not occurred, and what we see are entrenched autocracies with geopolitical ambitions. To me, the world looks more like what it looked like before World War II than about the future you're talking about. Now, I, do we know where the future is going? Do we know what might happen? No, but I would say you're in worse shape making that argument today than you were 10 years ago. Well, uh, I mean, by your account, 20, I think you- 20, I'm sorry, 20. I'm, right. I'm so old, but, I can't But again, we didn't do what I would recommend. I, I would have said, make a really prominent show of saying, this is a new world, and we're actually going to start abiding by international law. And we I know, but seriously, Bob, I mean, you live in the real world, and the fact that people didn't go along with what you're saying, or, you know, they didn't go along with what you're saying. They didn't go along with- the kellogg Briand Pact either after 1928. No, but I mean, I'm just talking about American policymakers. I know that, but American policymakers think they live in the real world, and even people who work in the Obama administration wouldn't go in the direction that you're talking about. So, Right, I mean, you know, uh, look. Who, it, who is going to? It's not, your, news, it's not news to me that my views differ from those of the American foreign policy establishment. What's clear to me is that the American foreign policy establishment has led the world in the general direction of ruin. Well, I, I mean, that's, I, uh, that last statement, I think, is absurd. You're implying that were it not for American foreign policy, the world would be fine. No, I'm and not implying say, that. No, we would have. We, it's not. I, and I must say that if the, if the history of the last 150 years tells us anything, it's that for all the failures and weaknesses and stupidities and hypocrisies of American foreign policy, all of which I acknowledge, uh, nevertheless, the world that we've been living in since the United States became the dominant power in 1945 is much, much better than the world that immediately preceded it. And in all respects on questions of economic prosperity, spread of democracy and general peace, Bob, better than what had come before for centuries. So you want to look at that world and say, look at all the bad things that have happened, and now I want perfection. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing but, to want. But see, I but, think a lot but of in reality, if you compare it to the real world that had existed and that we have seen before the United States began playing this role, it actually has been a remarkable accomplishment. Well, look, I'm pretty happy with the post-World War II order whose erosion you lament. Yes. In fact, I would have uh, encouraged – 
more consistent adherence with its purported rules. I'm not, I'm not saying that part of American foreign policy. Well, that's the foreign policy establishment you're talking about, though, right? What's that? That's the, foreign, that's the foreign policy establishment you said has led us to rack and ruin. Well, only in the last, you know, 15, 20 years have they really, have they really done, I, I think, a series of ill-advised things. And the funny thing is, most of them now agree. Listen, most ill-advised. of them now agree they were ill-advised. Max Boot just wrote a book saying I was wrong about everything. And, and you know, neoconservative says I was wrong Bob, about everything. And it's like, so Bob, why should you read a book written by you if you're Bob, wrong about everything? Bob, yeah. I don't think I was wrong about everything. Okay. Well, that's... <laughs> that's I, I don't know whether that means you're more enlightened or less enlightened than Max Boot. I will not even venture an opinion. I, I, will, I, will, uh, I will say that I acknowledge also, I, I would emphasize, some of the good, I think, has come from uh, globalization. You emphasize in your, in, your, in your book, for example, I think the, uh, a number of people have been pulled out of poverty around the world. That's good. Now, it has had the non-trivial downside of putting some pressure on American wages that's not nothing. Something we should think about. But it's happened. It's good. Um, I personally think if you if you look at the uh, fewer number of people killed in wars, probably has to do with two things: nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. And I do think growing economic entanglement makes relations among nations more non-zero sum, makes them less inclined to fight one another. I, that that's I, I I see that argument, and I saw it in 1910 too. Yeah, right. But things weren't nearly as, um, uh, first of all, uh, the countries weren't nearly as intertwined economically, but also I'm not that deterministic about it. Things can go awry if you screw up. That's why I point to things I consider screw ups and say, I think these were screw ups. And that's why you do the same. Yeah. And, and so, but, but I agree with a lot of, I, I think much of what I just said, you, you, some of what I just said, you agree with. I, I agree with the value of the rules-based post-World War II order. I, now, I, I don't think it was an act of generosity so much on our I part. I don't either. As, as you it said, it's like, it's like enlightened America first or enlightened exactly, America. That's exactly the phrase I yeah. use. I mean, right. I totally agree with you. Americans, let me hasten to say, Americans are not especially virtuous. They're not especially unselfish. As we can see, they're perfectly capable of all kinds of uh, bad behavior. So I don't, I don't want to attribute any special qualities to the American people other than a very favorable geography and a lot of wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I think we've had, uh, look, the Marshall Plan was genius, uh, more enlightened than a lot of things that have preceded it in world history. Right, um, but, you know, that was an imposition, too, and if you cared about what the Soviets thought, the same way you care about what the Russians think, the Soviets saw that as us throwing our economic weight around at their detriment, and that we used that to strengthen our strategic position vis-a-vis them, which would also be true. So yeah. why, is, why was that okay? But during the post-war period that you celebrate, there was a lot of respect for Soviet concerns. Dwight Eisenhower said, uh, listen, I'm really happy about these Hungarian freedom fighters, but we ain't touching that. Because the Russians That was want- not a respect for Soviet concern. That was a fear of getting into a nuclear war or a major war over Hungary. That had nothing with, to do with... Ru- well, who would have launched the nuclear weapons? No, no, but that wasn't respect for... It, it wasn't like they thought... We need to understand the poor Russians. It was. No, like- I don't mean. I don't mean that. I mean. I mean exactly what I propose. I'm not talking about empathizing with Putin's pain, for God's sake. I'm talking about anticipating his reactions, which could be bad for us, and in some cases, bad for him and bad for us, which they often are. That's what Dwight Eisenhower did when he in chose not to intervene in Hungary. But you wouldn't have said that about anything that Atchison was doing in the late 1940s and, and early 50s. I think that the Atchison mission was to push the, the Soviets as far as they possibly could. That's what the Berlin airlift was about. That's what our policies in Greece and Turkey and Iran were about. They weren't about figuring out what the, the Soviets felt they needed. They were about being really tough. And Atchison well, didn't even want to have negotiations with the Soviets. I mean, right? we can some some cases we showed restraint. Some cases we didn't. We seem to have calculated well, that's true now too. Right, that's exactly. True. Except except that we we don't seem to have calculated as well because there are more dust ups around the periphery. But, oh, really? You think there are more dust ups than there were fifty years ago, or not to mention a hundred years ago? I mean, this is this is again what I object to. You're, you're not saying there were more dust. No, I don't mean around the world. I just mean around the Soviet or Russian periphery. I agree with that, too. But, I mean, I would still say 
what you're seeing is not abnormal. Yes, there were dust ups around the peripheries of nations that believe they have spheres of influence. Yes, that's right. what international politics is all about. That, that's nothing new about right. that. We didn't create the fact that there are dust ups when there are overlapping spheres of influence. Right. And what you have in common with the other realists is you recognize that, look, it's a fact of history. Great powers want spheres of influence, but we should be entitled to a uniquely expansive one. And even as powers emerge like China, who want, want to do what we, what we did when we were an emerging power, which is right. expand our sphere of influence, we can't let them do that. Now that you have in common with the other realists. I don't get how no, that- No, I'm not. I don't have in common with the other realists. The other realists want to allow them to have their spheres of influence. No, and no, not in China. Steve Walt, I just talked to him. Oh, really? Well, he wants to do offshore balancing. He's not as alarmed as you are about maybe about, he, he certainly, I don't know if you think China's going to like, actually uh, take by force anything other than Taiwan or Japan, Korea, whatever. I don't think he thinks that, but <laughs> but he thinks that- You're um, okay with him taking Taiwan though. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to put those words in his mouth. Okay. But, but, but I would say to you, do you really think that in 10 years, as Ch if China continues to grow economically and his military continues to grow, can we realistically stop them from taking Taiwan? We can realistically stop them if we grow our military capacity, yes. And also the Chinese have to consider something that goes beyond Taiwan, which is something that the Japanese understood, but then didn't listen to themselves when they attacked uh, Pearl Harbor, which is, yeah, they can win uh, the initial victory, but then they're dealing with the richest, most advanced industrial nation and its allies in the world. So right. can we can win for a year, but can we win for 10 years? And that's right. always going to be a calculation. I actually think they'd be very reluctant to take Taiwan by force, even though they do plan to ultimately Deuce. absorb it. Right, right. Um, the, the, uh, so anyway. Um, I think we've settled all the questions, Bob. I, I think we have. Just quickly, you may get the picture on what progressive realism is, you know, respect for international and the nurturing of global governance to solve various kinds of problems. Um, and uh, let me ask you a question uh, before we go. Sure. Do you have a candidate who represents your views on these matters? Uh, if, if uh, I actually think uh, Bernie Sanders has started articulating his foreign policy views more fully, and uh, they're better than, um, well, I'm not that aware. I'm not that conversant in, like, aspiring presidential candidates' foreign policies, but uh, I like his better than Hillary's. Um, there are not, no, there, aren't, there are not many. Uh, th there are, I'm only aware of one progressive realist at the moment, and you're looking at him. Yeah, I mean, you know, what I, I guess what I would say about that is that I don't think there are candidates representing either of our views likely to get nominated in either party. I think Bernie has a chance. I think if he were younger, he'd have a chance of getting nominated. But I, don't think you're, I think you're right to doubt that Bernie actually represents your views. So oh. I don't think you're anti-free trade, and I think the progressive oh, oh, the oh. Democratic Party is anti-free trade. Well, on free trade, I actually have to say that something Trump did with NAFTA is – uh, the kind of thing I'm in principle fine with is not uh, not like blow up trade agreements, but steer them a little leftward so that, for example, now Mexican uh, and apparently in the new NAFTA, uh, Mexican workers can unionize. There, there are these various things that will slightly have have a slight upward effect on Mexican wages. The left in Mexico likes that. It slightly alleviates pressure in the U.S. That kind of I say your left wing economic policies in the international scope should not be nationalist and unilateral. You should try to implement them in regional and, and global trade agreements. Okay. Which Bernie would be fine with, I think. I don't mm -hmm. know. Okay. So anything else you want to say uh, by way of conceding that I'm right and you're wrong? I think a general concession ought to do it at the end of a conversation like this. I don't think I need to get into specifics. I was I? thinking more of a ritual of submission, but whatever. <laughs> um, so let me say... Everyone should read your book. It's short. That's good. Yeah, that's its great virtue. Good. The Jungle Grows Back, America and Our Imperiled World. It's a garden metaphor. Well, they have to read the book to understand exactly what you mean. And we didn't have a chance to get into this question of what is the state of nature and what isn't, which is a... Which is something I think you and I disagree about, but we'll have to do that another time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wonder whether you can say anything is a state of nature technically, but thank you, Bob. Uh, maybe down the road you can come back again. Certainly, uh, I know when you write a book, you're in the mood to talk to me, if no other time. So, so <laughs> write one fast. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot.